As of the end of July 2024, there is an ongoing conflict where a low-end estimate of 40,000 civilians have already been killed. Without immediate action, an estimated 2 million civilians face starvation. It is arguably the worst humanitarian crisis in the world, and hardly any international attention is being paid to it. The Civil War in Sudan The current conflict began when the tensions between Abdel Fattah al-Burhan of the Sudanese Armed Forces and Hemedti of the Rapid Support Forces boiled over into open war in April 2023. But to understand that, we have to go back much further. We begin in the early 1800s. At this time, the region that is now Sudan was controlled by several kingdoms and sultanates. To the north was Egypt, de jure under the control of the Ottoman Empire, but de facto ruled by Muhammad Ali. In 1820, Ali launched a military campaign to conquer the kingdoms and sultanates to his south, many of which fell in the next four years. Over the next few decades, under Ali and his descendants' rule, Egypt continued its conquests, taking control of regions to the east that now form the borders with Ethiopia and the Red Sea, to the south in lands that are now largely part of South Sudan, and culminating in the conquest of Darfur in 1874, forming the border with what is now Chad. It was during this window of time that Egypt took on significant debt to finance modernization, the military, their conquests, and a side of royal extravagance. To make a long story short, Egypt defaulted on their debts in 1878, leading first to the joint control of Egypt by France and Britain, note Egypt was still technically also under Ottoman rule, before Great Britain managed to attain sole control over Egypt, while Egypt was still technically under Ottoman rule. The Sudanese region was turned into the Anglo-Egyptian condominium, de jure under joint control, but de facto under British rule. At this point, you might be asking, Admiral, what does this have to do with the current civil war? Well, all of this setup is to provide the background of how Sudan became Sudan. The key piece from these early conquests was that Arab-dominated Egypt came to control several regions that were almost entirely non-Arab. Of particular note, what is now the region of Darfur and what is now the country of South Sudan. Darfur, along with other parts of modern Sudan, gained an influx of Arabian settlers during this period under Egyptian control. One major change for Sudan under British rule was that the South Sudan region was governed separately, with local leaders dominating governance. The reason for this change was that the southern regions were predominantly Christian and animist blacks, while the northern regions were Muslim Arabs and Arabized indigenous blacks. However, this distribution of government changed in the years after World War II. With pressure put on the British by Egyptian and Sudanese Arab nationalists, Great Britain relented by reincorporating the southern regions back with the north. It was a few years later that the Egyptian Revolution took place in 1952. As a consequence, Sudan gained its independence from both Great Britain and Egypt in 1956. The southern regions of Sudan were heavily underrepresented in the new government, leading to unease about their rights and concerns being taken seriously by the government. This unease became openly hostile as Sudan's Arab and Muslim-dominated government attempted to impose Arabic and Islam as the language and religion on the southern territories. Low-level violence that had been taking place since independence escalated significantly in the early 1960s between the predominantly Arab and Arabized Muslim North and the predominantly Black, Christian, and Animist South. The First Sudanese Civil War, yes, the first, lasted until 1972, when the Addis Ababa Agreement established a new constitution, which included the creation of the Southern Sudan Autonomous Region. As part of the peace agreement, the Autonomous Region had its own law enforcement agency, legislature, and president, while being subordinate to the Sudanese government. While tensions remained, not only over autonomy, but also jurisdiction over newly discovered oil deposits in the Autonomous Region, a relative peace held for over 10 years. This ended abruptly in 1983 when Sudan's government, led by Ghaffar Namiri, established Sudan as an Islamic state and abruptly ended the Southern Sudan Autonomous Region. The civil war this sparked lasted until 2005, with the conclusion culminating in the independence of South Sudan in 2011. 
There are still disputes between the two countries, including control of several border regions, but with peacekeepers in these disputed regions, open conflict has largely subsided. Concurrent with the Second Sudanese Civil War was conflict within Sudan's Darfur province. While not part of South Sudan, Darfur has a significant black population. As far back as the 1980s, ethnic conflict instigated by Arab militias known today as the Janjaweed took place over control of land, particularly grazing land, within the province of Darfur. This conflict replicates the racial dynamics of the first two Sudanese civil wars, an Arab and Arabized population imposing its will on a black population. It should be noted that the majority of Darfur's black population is Muslim, so the religious differences were not in play in this conflict. The other big dividing line between the two groups was that the Arab groups are largely nomadic herders, while the black groups are largely settled pastoralists. By the early 2000s, multiple rebel groups, foremost the Sudan Liberation Movement alongside the Justice and Equality Movement, had formed in Darfur to counter the Janjaweed militias and the Sudanese government that backed them, though I will note that Sudan's government denied backing the Janjaweed. It is in 2003 that the conflict is characterized as having escalated to war. Even as the civil war between South Sudan and Sudan was winding down, the violence in Darfur only escalated. Janjaweed militias took advantage of the situation, or more likely were encouraged by Sudan's dictator Omar al-Bashir, to engage in widespread attacks on civilian populations in what is considered an ethnic cleansing and genocide. Between 2003 and 2008, an estimated 300,000 civilians were killed, with another 2.5 million displaced. In 2008, the United Nations Security Council had demanded the Sudanese government disarm the Janjaweed, which the government failed to do. The following year, the International Criminal Court had charged Omar al-Bashir with committing genocide, the first time the ICC had made this charge against a sitting world leader. Unfortunately, neither of these actions stopped the bloodshed. With conflict continuing to impact the Darfur region, Janjaweed militias were eventually given official status in 2013 as the Rapid Support Forces under Mohamed Habdan Dagalo, better known as Hamedti. Al-Bashir envisioned them as a well-trained, centrally controlled force that could be rapidly deployed against threats to his regime. This vision was never realized, though Sudan significantly expanded the ranks and the role of the RSF. Initially used as border guards and to continue to combat rebel groups in Darfur, the Rapid Support Forces were also deployed as mercenaries for the civil wars in Yemen and Libya. Their numbers rapidly increased from about five to 6,000 in 2013 to over 40,000 deployed in Yemen alone in 2016. This process in essence created two armed forces within the country of Sudan, the regular military in the Sudanese armed forces and a paramilitary force in the Rapid Support Forces. There is speculation that Omar al-Bashir did this deliberately in order to counter the threat of a coup by the regular armed forces by creating a second military more loyal to himself. If that was al-Bashir's intent, it failed miserably. After months of pro-democracy protests, he was overthrown in a military-led coup in April of 2019, with the backing of Hamedti and the Rapid Support Forces. In fact, the RSF was deployed alongside the Sudanese armed forces by the new Transitional Military Council against protesters, pro-democracy and pro-al-Bashir alike, were often crushed mercilessly. An agreement was struck to transition to a democratic government from the military-controlled interim government. One component of that transition was an end to the civil war in Darfur in August of 2020. For the first time since the 1980s, there were no major conflicts within the borders of Sudan. It was not to last. Just a year later, another military coup took place in October of 2021, just one month before the full transition to civilian leadership was supposed to take place. This coup created a new military junta led by Abdel Fattah al-Burhan, who had been the de facto leader of Sudan since the 2019 coup, with Hamedti as de facto second in government. Over the following year, tensions increased between al-Burhan and Hamedti. Both worked to cultivate new political allies within Sudanese society as they jockeyed for leadership of Sudan. Al-Burhan returned many former Omar al-Bashir officials to government, including the Islamist faction. 
Hamedti, now one of the richest men in Sudan from seizing control of Darfur's gold mines in the late 2010s, connected with civilian elites who predominantly backed a non-military democratic government. Efforts to resolve these internal divisions culminated in a December 2022 framework to restore civilian rule. Of particular relevance, the agreement would have recognized the rapid support forces within the regular armed forces, but under the direct command of a civilian head of state instead of the army chief. This would be the case during a transition period that would lead to the RSF being integrated with the regular army. The timetable for this integration was undetermined at signing and proved a critical point of contention. During the first few months of 2023, both the Sudanese army and the RSF sought new recruits and military allies within the country, the most visible sign of how the attempted framework had not resolved the split between al-Burhan and Hamedi. Tensions heightened even further when al-Burhan proposed dissolving the sovereign council and forming a new military council, the implication being the removal of Hamedti's position in government. At the same time, the rapid support forces moved additional troops near the capital of Khartoum, bringing Sudan to the brink of civil war. An agreement on March 11th was reached in which al-Burhan and Hamedti would form a new joint security committee. The RSF pulled back from the capital, and the threat of open conflict was, temporarily, avoided. As negotiations continued, the deadline for a final agreement in early April was missed. Once again, the contention was the integration of the rapid support forces with the Sudanese armed forces. Hamedti supported a proposal for a 10-year timetable for integration. Al-Burhan pushed for a two-year timetable. With negotiations falling apart, troops were deployed in strategic areas around the country, most notably the capital of Khartoum. By mid-April, the situation reached a crisis point. Rapid support forces deployments near Marwi on April 11th led to multiple clashes. Outside powers, most notably the joint efforts of the United States, the United Kingdom, Saudi Arabia, and the United Arab Emirates, along with the United Nations, attempted to mediate. But it was all for naught. On the morning of April 15th, the Rapid Support Forces launched a series of attacks against Khartoum International Airport, the Old Presidential Palace, and Sudanese Armed Forces military bases. Even Abdel Fattah al-Burhan himself was under threat when his residence was attacked by RSF fighters in the opening hours of conflict in what is described as an assassination attempt. Both sides had their advantages as the civil war began. The Sudan armed forces had, and continue to have, numbers on their side, as well as heavy equipment such as tanks and planes. The rapid support forces, however, had troops with the most experience fighting after years of mercenary action in Yemen and Libya not to mention their decades of action in the Darfur region. Within days, it was clear the fighting would not end anytime soon. The RSF had deployed tens of thousands of soldiers to the capital and had shown the SAF's superior firepower alone would not dislodge them. Talks had completely broken down between al-Burhan and Hamedti, with multiple ceasefire agreements being immediately violated. The fight for the capital took place in the streets and communities where civilians lived. The RSF incorporated tactics they had used for decades in Darfur, Yemen, and Libya, occupying residential homes to dissuade being attacked, targeting hospitals not under their control to disrupt and prevent the injured from receiving care, and taking no precautions in preventing civilian casualties when attacking SAF forces. For its part, SAF forces have taken little care in avoiding civilian casualties, often targeting RSF units even when they have positioned themselves near or among civilians. Both sides signed on to the Treaty of Jeddah in May 2023, whose provisions included the safe passage of civilians, protection of relief workers, and not using civilians as human shields. But in the year of fighting since the signing, all of these provisions have been violated. As outlined previously, Sudan was no stranger to war, but never before had a grinding conflict taken place within the capital itself, now bitterly fought over between the SAF and RSF. Dozens of sieges began, especially in Darfur, where the SAF had initial control of cities, but the region at large was the homeland and base of operations for most RSF soldiers and military divisions. As if these dynamics weren't confusing enough, numerous local militias also joined the conflict or declared neutrality. Notable of the latter were most elements of the now splintered Sudan Liberation Movement and a new alliance called the Darfur Joint Protection Force. Most notable of the former were the various Janjaweed militias that now openly joined with the RSF 
and the Sudan Liberation Movement North, which, confusingly, controls sections of the southern regions of Sudan. This branch of the SLM openly attacked the SAF in June and July of 2023, but evidence even a year on indicates that there is not any kind of formal alliance between them and the RSF. It appears to be one militia using the situation for personal advantage. The war itself has thus far gone in the favor of the rapid support forces. They were able to trap al-Burhan for months at the army headquarters in Khartoum before a Sudanese armed forces breakthrough was made on August 24th of 2023. Since then, most of Khartoum has fallen into RSF hands. The RSF has also occupied most of Jazeera, the region considered the breadbasket of Sudan. Across Darfur, most of the cities that the SAF had controlled have fallen to the RSF after long sieges. In the SAF's favor, most of the militias that had initially declared neutrality have now openly joined the SAF in fighting against the RSF and its allies. There are still organized pockets of resistance against the RSF in the west and south, but otherwise the main front lines are around the capital of Khartoum and to its north and south. Nevertheless, the widespread scope of the civil war has impacted huge swaths of the country, including regions that have historically been largely unaffected by previous conflicts. This has led to a massive refugee crisis. Over 12 million people, roughly a quarter of Sudan's pre-war population, have been displaced. Two million have fled the country. Another 10 million are displaced within the country's borders. Humanitarian aid to Sudan has been totally insufficient to the scale of the crisis. Even aid that had been flowing was severely disrupted in late 2023 and early 2024 from Houthi attacks on shipping in the Red Sea. What had been the primary means of transporting food and medical supplies from Asia was made exponentially more expensive and had the effect of both delaying and decreasing the amount of aid humanitarian organizations were able to send. Also in February of 2024, the Rapid Support Forces closed the primary border crossing between Chad and Darfur, another significant disruption to the flow of aid. Even with the routes that are still available, the RSF and Sudanese armed forces haven't held to international standards of permitting humanitarian aid to reach civilians unimpeded. One location that has been highlighted as far as crisis points is the city of El Fasher in North Darfur, where over 1.5 million people are trapped by RSF forces. The city itself, prior to the siege, was a critical hub for humanitarian aid to the surrounding region, as it was connected via road to Port Sudan, where most international aid is shipped in via the Red Sea. This is yet another factor in the disruptions of humanitarian supplies that have exacerbated the crisis across Sudan, not to mention the inability for supplies to reach the besieged population in Al-Fashur itself. It gets worse. In West Darfur, Janjaweed militias and the RSF have once again reignited their systemic attacks on the indigenous people of the region, in particular the Masalit. With few journalists or non-RSF-controlled sources on the ground, the scale of these attacks and present death toll are unknown, though a United Nations report in January 2024 estimated between 10 and 15,000 had been killed in the city of El Janina alone. The brutality of what is being perpetrated is shocking. I will be short but blunt. According to eyewitnesses, Janjaweed militias and RSF units set up checkpoints between Darfur settlements and neighboring Chad. They proceeded to kill any fighting-age men they encountered and sexually assaulted women and girls. The death toll from these incidents is unknown, as the militias and RSF did not permit the retrieval nor burying of the dead. The deaths from these attacks in the Darfur region are thus far not included in statistics for deaths for this most recent Sudanese civil war. And I will repeat... The overall death toll from this new ethnic cleansing in the last year is completely unknown. Unsurprising, Darfur is one of the regions where civilians are suffering the most. Alongside Kordofan, El Jazeera, and the capital region, they have all been marked by heavy fighting, and as of June 2024 are characterized as high risk for famine. In all, an estimated 25.6 million people, over half of Sudan's population, are in hunger crisis. Of that number, over 8 million are at imminent risk of famine. If nothing changes from the current status quo, 2 million may starve over the next year, 300,000 within the next few months. 
and that doesn't include the other impacts of the ongoing civil war, not just the fighting between the RSF and SAF, but the renewed ethnic cleansing in Darfur. So how can we stop it? When it comes to the civil war itself, the decision is currently up to two men, Abdel Fattah al-Burhan and Hamedti. Given their history and nearly year and a half of war, it is highly unlikely they will come to the table now. That being said, even once a ceasefire is in place, or one side actually loses, there are a lot of internal sources of tension that need to be resolved. There are multiple ethnic conflicts that also overlap with racial perceptions. Those conflicts often have as their origin point tension over resources, hence another layer of solutions that would need to be implemented. And none of that even gets into the disagreement on the form of government, principally the pursuit of democratic rule versus military authoritarian rule. But historically, Sudan's authoritarian governments have often been heavily influenced by theocratic rule and imposing a narrow interpretation of Islamic law across the whole country. It is to bring awareness to these complicated underlying problems that I started this video talking about the origins of modern Sudan in the 1800s. Ultimately, even when a ceasefire is in place, there will need to be a massive effort on the part of the global community to rebuild and keep the peace, to help repair the metaphorical bridges that decades and decades of tension and conflict have burnt. But with an immediate ceasefire effectively out of the question, what are the options? Well first, massively increasing funding for humanitarian aid being sent to Sudan. Even without current supply disruptions, only about one-third of the required aid is even being sent in the first place. Secondly, even if we don't get a ceasefire, putting additional international pressure on both Al-Burhan and Hamedti to allow for the free transit of humanitarian aid and the establishment of humanitarian corridors to get civilians out of direct war zones is key to minimizing civilian suffering and loss. It's one thing to know about this crisis. It's another to do something about it. I will provide links in the description of where to offer financial support to Sudan humanitarian aid, in addition, I would encourage you to contact your government representatives, both to encourage government financial assistance to humanitarian aid and to put political pressure on the two sides to end the conflict and allow that aid through to the civilians who need it. As an American, I am most familiar with whom to contact here, which would be your U.S. House representative and your U.S. senators. I will have another link from Keep Eyes on Sudan for whom else to contact, as well as how to contact representatives for Canada, the UK, and Australia. For other countries, if you need help finding who to contact, you can leave your country name in the comments and, time permitting, I will do my best to track down how to find the necessary government representatives. The first step to solving a problem is being aware of it. You are now aware of this one. And as dire as it is, please do not dwell upon it. Your own suffering doesn't do anything to help the Sudanese people. But please spread the word. Share financial resources if you are able. Contact your representatives. If you have the contacts and the numbers in your local area, protest for action. We all do what we can. Until next time, take care.